Starliner Media. Starliner Media presents Music Night at the Majestic with your host, Michael Boswell. Brought to you by... When Science and Displays Direct was launched 15 years ago, it featured a complete line of banners and stands, product displays, and more. Today, the company is known as SDD and is the industry leader in turnkey, no-inventory POP programs. SDD has expanded into branding programs for both corporate and private label, as well as consulting services for retail showroom design and more. Visit sdd-us.com. That's sdd-us.com. All right, everybody, time once again for Music Night at the Majestic, and joining me tonight, well, tell you what, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Larry, this is my brother Daryl, and this is my other brother Daryl. <laughs> All right, now why don't you tell everybody who you really are? I'm William Sanderson. John oh, Bolstead. Oh, I know uh, that name. Tony Papenfuss, and he's John Bolstad. <laughs> all right. Now that we got that out of the way. Yeah. We are all talking, aren't we? <laughs> That's the way these things seem to go. All righty, then. All, all right. right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, when, uh, uh, when we started telling some folks that you guys were going to be on the show, the, you know, it was amazing – the, the response that we got because it immediately brought back such fond memories for everybody. And, you know, they were you know, so happy that to get a chance to, to see you guys all together. So. Well, uh, so am I. <laughs> I am as well. Yes, we are. Yes. So good <laughs> to see my friends' faces, my brother's faces. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, the, uh, when, when we did our, our tech rehearsal, if you will, you know, uh, when, when you three first saw each other on screen, it really was for me, it was like I was a visitor to a family reunion because it was so wonderful to see the three of you so excited and happy to see each other. And, you know, what that told me was you three really had a strong bond as brothers. Well, we pulled them, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gift. It's a providential to have, as Tony has said many times, a regular job. And uh, my parents were alive, and they could see the show without four-letter words. And unlike yeah. a lot of them, I had to do. Anyway, it's a joy to be here. Thank you for having me, Michael. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's good to be here. Yeah, I'll tell, tell you what. Be here. Um, yeah, over the years on the show, uh, in a way, because of circumstances, we were we were kind of in our own little bubble. In a way, we were we were sort of out of the mainstream of uh, the rest of the cast and guest artists and things like that. Uh, uh, sometimes because of how the show was written, uh, or just. Sometimes it sort of naturally went that way. It seemed like people sort of stayed a bit away from us when we were like together shooting. And then when we were on the road doing promotional tours and stuff like that, uh, we were in our own little contained unit as well. So, so over the years, we couldn't help but make a sort of, you know, a little bit of bonding. There had to be a connection there. Otherwise, we uh, well, we wouldn't have survived both literally course, and yeah. and in uh, in showbiz. So, yeah, it, we we got to be pretty close, actually. Yeah. My yeah, we'll see. Uh, and least, yeah. 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 we'll get into the music part of the show, you know, here. But you know, I'd be remiss in not giving the uh, the viewers, you know, an opportunity to hear some things I know that they want to hear about you guys and your time on new heart and all that uh episode one is john and i had, had discussed in the show before you three were not supposed to be recurring characters correct no it was one shot deal and when the three of you showed up for that first episode what what do you recall william i'll start with you well as they can tell you i'm always nervous 
but uh, I did. I thought it was a one shot thing, and uh, 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 just another job. You know, it turned out to last eight seasons. But did I answer you? Yeah. Yep. 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 You did. Now, t- uh, Tony, was was that your take? on it as well that you know it's going to be a, a one-off deal on this you know new heart show and oh absolutely there was no uh there was no reason to think otherwise they they had you know uh it was just it's just three's guy it's it's a one one shot gag and you know how long how many times could you use that you know, <laughs> you right. know? right and uh so the uh the reaction from the audience it was just really uh you know they liked it a lot you could tell and that's lovely having a live audience yeah. so i'm thinking well hell you got the one shot at least we nailed it so, uh, <laughs> so it, there was a great deal of satisfaction just doing the one and i was i was fine with that yeah now uh, john when did you realize that you guys had you know caught some magic um, I, as soon as I met Bill and Tony, I just had a, a simpatico feeling with the two guys. Yeah, my brothers. Now, when you, when you think back to filming, is there a particular episode that stands out in your mind that you guys did, William? I'll start with you. Oh, you know, not really, but I thought. There was a young actress who was beautiful, and I got to have a fantasy about her and get shocked and die and come back to life. So, you know, it was the uh, ultimate in fantasy. Uh I I also uh, like the show where Tony left us and ran off and... (laughs) And he and Tony was his, he said some wonderful sentence. Ah, oh, the one where I wasn't on the screen, uh, something like that. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing him, but and uh, John and Tony, well, <laughs> and it, it, to put over my mouth, it, I love <laughs> all this that it just and a chance to mention Bob Newhart, who is a saint, if he didn't like us. We wouldn't have lasted. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, as you were on there for eight seasons, I'm going to say that Bob liked you guys. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, how about Tony, for you, Tony? Was there an episode or you know, several episodes that you know you think you know, most fondly of? Um, yeah. Well, the uh, the the one that Bill mentioned, the uh, card where I was just it's prodigal Daryl uh, was prodigal Daryl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that was uh, most fun, particularly for me. I mean, I got to dance, I got to be a rebel, and all that. And it's also always fun. It's happened in a couple other worlds I've had on stage and stuff, where uh, you're not there, and everybody's talking about you while you're not there. So you're like the main focus of everything, and you don't have to do a damn thing. Uh-huh. And, then, and then when I did when I did appear. Uh, I came out boogieing, and I, had, I, I can't. I'm not a dancer, so that was uh, that was fun. But also, strangely enough, the uh, one that keeps uh, coming back for me is we did a Thanksgiving. We did a couple of Thanksgiving ones, but we did one with uh, uh, with uh, Joe Ferrer, and uh, the the whole the whole family got together. Over finally, they got together at our cafe and there was something just so i don't know it really made me feel thanksgiving ish did we throw pancakes in that or was that a different one no i think we we uh dismembered a turkey we did uh, we didn't carve it we dismembered it and uh the chaos was going though so yeah was- yeah definitely so uh so those two but as bill said Every one of them was, uh, it was just a, a gas. Uh, the, being with those people, um, having the, the great scripts, uh, God bless those uh, writers for running with it. 
They had, uh, I mean, they really got into having three characters that they could literally write anything for. You could have them do or say anything. So they had no limits, and I think that gave them a big charge. So, and they ran with it, and they, they did good by us. Yeah. Now, how about you, John? What's what's uh, a favorite episode of yours? Well, there were a few. A few of, uh, um, the Prodigal Daryl, I would say, was was like one of the main ones. And then also uh, um, when uh, Bill and I were in search of the Graceland and Tony was playing chess with, with Bob uh, back at the end, and we kept having to check in with him and and uh, let him know where we were <laughs> and we i think we finally found graceland didn't we bill yeah i believe so i uh some of my memory is going but uh, <laughs> uh i should interject they both both don tony and john knew more about stage acting than i did and they had been discovered at the mark taper forum and uh I was grateful. I learned. I can't help but suck up. As I learned a lot from them. You know, one time I said to John, uh, "I wish I could say this, ad lib something." He said, "Thank you." Yeah. And uh, you know, Tony helped me in many ways. Not that he wanted. When I came in, it took a while, but I was doing all kinds of stuff that was unnecessary. And he said, "You were going to do it all." That first episode we did. Yeah. No. Luckily, they cut some of my footwork off and various things. But, uh, you know, I, I could talk all day about hanging with them. Always be here when we traveled and the three of us were together. I don't know. Is it, the sum is more important than the parts? Is that, what is it? You're in Groucho's uh, uh, old dressing room, right? Correct. I don't. Correct. I don't know. Maybe I'm not making sense, but I didn't want to. Groucho's okay, but I want to see all of them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, the uh, it, it, what, we're, what we're talking about here with Groucho, you know, here here at the Majestic Theater, the Monks Brothers used to play here. Yeah. And we you know, our office you know, studio is in uh, what used to be the dressing room. So we're I I. I you know, try to tell myself that I'm sitting where Groucho sat, so I can hopefully you know absorb some of that that magic. <laughs> the magic that. That. So now, t tell me about the episode where Johnny Carson and his uh, cameo. What was that like? That was great. Uh, you want to go first, Tony? <laughs> oh, I mean, it was uh, well. We we didn't we didn't see him uh, all week until the very moment. Before he came out, I think, or was he in a dress rehearsal? I'm not even sure. I think it was a one show. Yeah, he came over. Yeah, I don't know if he saw him until he showed up. He left his other show that he had yeah. taped and came straight there. Right. And <laughs> then he was there, and it was with him. Uh, I, uh, I had, uh, I was a Mighty Carson art player. Okay. Time. One of the first things I ever did on television, actually, maybe, maybe the first. I'm not sure, but uh, I don't, I don't believe I uh, said, "Hey, remember me?" We had that joke. Yeah, you know, you George Washington, and I. Uh, no, I didn't do that. Uh, thank God. And uh, and he was, uh, I, I was just. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I was thrilled. Like I knew that he from the other thing that he was a pro and he really cares about everybody uh, getting their laugh and having things work all great and stuff. Uh, I remember uh, in the uh, in the Mighty Carson Art Player thing, he was like dressed as George Washington, and uh, during our first rehearsal, um, he noticed. Or something uh, and he gave me a tip about you know you're going to get a bigger laugh if you do this. I can't remember what it was, 
and uh, then we went through the whole thing, and it did get a big laugh. And then after the thing was over, he was guarding backstage to uh, change, get uh, get out of the costume with his George Washington time heels and the uh, wig and the deal. And uh, <laughs> as he was running back, he turned around and said, "See, don't try to get a big laugh." And he slipped off his high heels and went right across the floor. He said, I, told you, I told you, you did great, man. And, uh, and uh, anyway, there he was again, and again, he was gracious and, and friendly, and he had fun with the whole thing, and that was, that was marvelous. That was like, a pro being uh, a human being is just great. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I remember one of the episodes that sticks with me was when you guys were trying to nurse Julia Duffy's character, back to health yeah i mean that that had some wonderful moments in it our puppets yes yeah. exactly tell us about that episode it was the only time a director ever yelled at us <laughs> <laughs> for some reason we couldn't get these things right i mean and it seemed like i was we were doing puppet stuff but he said they're puppets i mean they're, come on you guys we I mean, he really uh he was at the end of his rope because there was something we were doing that, I mean, he didn't screw up a puppet. I, I don't understand. I never did get what he was talking about, but I remember that about that show, the first time we ever got yelled at. Is that why you guys never appeared on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> you were banned for being Daniel the Lion. <laughs> uh, well, tell you what, we'll, we'll we'll come back to uh, New Heart stories here. But since the show is Music Night at the Majestic, why don't we get into a uh, little bit of music now, William? Uh, I've uh, you know, read your book. Yes, I'm that guy, which I actually have a copy of right here. So if anybody's you know. Out looking at books, this is William's book, and you have got some great stories. And can I, can I for, put the subtitle in there? Because uh, <laughs> yes, I'm that guy. Uh, the rough and tumble life of a character actor. You know, uh, there's a lot of that guys. But I just wanted to add that. <laughs> <laughs> And hey, for those of you watching who enjoy autobiographies, one of the things that makes William's book so good is the fact that it's written in his conversational style. So as you read the book, you can picture William telling you, telling you these stories personally. Well, now, you. I had help. I had help. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, your your help did did good in convey, conveying your uh, your presence, shall we say? I see but, the Elvis uh, uh, picture in the background there. Yep, we've got, I've got uh, Elvis oh, up oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 we had a uh, guy come in and help me organize uh, Ray uh, Ray Watch. And anyway, he was wonderful, and he got two books. He told me. After he wrote, he helped us to read it. You know, Ray Richmond, of course. I'm, I'm nervous when I talk about somebody else. <laughs> Thank you, though, for reading it. It was uh, you know, the Elvis part I see in my uh, uh, talking and being in his house. That was fun to recall. Yeah. Well, in, in the book, you you talk about a couple of run-ins that you had with Elvis when you were a kid. Oh, I was a fan of Corbett. Hoping I wouldn't say too much to you, but I was a child when I first saw him. I was in Kansas and Leo in the fifth grade. Fifth grade and came in a comfort. And uh, in the uh, tenth grade, I actually got in the house. But, uh, yeah, he got uh, mad at me man, for Bumping. He would have these parties that lasted all night. Now, this time I'm in high school, and I was hitting head on. And uh, he told me I not to do that, man. And I apologized. He was embarrassed. And he said, oh, it's okay. I just keep having to buy new motors for these bumper cars. Where he would have his private party. But he did once we were playing football, football, before it got so popular. 
for letting me. You said you want to sit in the limo, because uh, I was just in the hall and uh, drinking his free Pepsi. He, I said I don't want to get it dirty, and he said uh, Bardal won't get it dirty. He had a friend, and <laughs> I told him not too much about it, but it. Uh, I just am so grateful to get it done. The road is getting more narrow, and I think John John Ray Richmond. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, in the book, you, you've got uh, a couple of other Elvis stories that I'm going to say for the book so that uh, you know, people can read them uh, in there. But, you know, in reading it, it, uh, it amazed me how, as a kid, you got yourself into those situations where you got to be face to face with Elvis. So that, that was that was pretty impressive. Thank you, I guess. But I was... <laughs> I was always by myself because if I get run off or something, and the one time I had somebody with me, you know, it's in the book. But uh, so much for reading. <laughs> All right. Well, tell you what. Now, John, you know, John is so subtle and uh, modest. You know, after he was on the show previously, a friend of his wrote me and said, did John tell you about, you know, our band? And I said, no. <laughs> and he sends me pictures of, you know, John up on stage and uh, singing. And John, why don't you tell us a bit about that? Well, we sang at the, uh, at the Troubad uh, not at the, at the Palomino. I don't know if you remember. Brad. Uh, Sang a couple of songs that my friend Don had written. It was my friend Kelly Edwards, and uh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Now, did, didn't didn't you also get a uh, an invite to, to join a band that people may have heard of? Oh, what? Oh, did, yeah. Didn't didn't you get an invite to to, to join a pretty well known singing group? Yeah, when I was in Vermont, the Beach Boys were there. And, they, they, uh, Carl asked me to come on the road with him, <laughs> but I said I have to get back to work the next day. So, <laughs> and then we sang on my, my ex and myself. We we sang on stage Barbara Ann with him a couple of times in Branson, Missouri, and then in L.A. Oh, you know, he that. You know so yeah, I don't do that. Yeah, John, did you call a uh, concert? Uh, Bonnie's concert in San Francisco. They, what? They, no one could get a ticket to the concert. I recall John said he was talking to the lady and, and she said, well, if you're who you say you are, I'll give you a ticket. Something like that, John? I, I may have. I don't remember. Uh, well, you gave me a, you gave me a tape from Steve Earl, a guitar panel, and I like that a lot. I think it's... it's it's my, that one I don't I don't remember. My mind, my mind. Well, you're very generous. Well, I'll tell you, tell you what, that, that is an album worth sharing. I did say, you know, that uh, the, the three of us, you know, if, if, uh, we all have to be here together because if one was missing, he was like the lead singer was missing. Ah! <laughs> yeah, I can hear it soon. And I grew up around a lot of music and we had some records. But when I talk about most of the people, they're dead. Yeah. But one was Jerry Lee Lewis. I saw a lot in Memphis. And uh, Elton John said he's the best rock and roll piano player in the world. But uh, well, I'm grateful we had a lot of artists, black and white, in go through Memphis sax records. So. And I want to hear Tony talk about uh, Leon Russell. If you can practice. <laughs> yeah, well, tell tell you, tell you what, Tony. You know, you're you're from Minneapolis, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you know Prince? Were you buddies? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had uh, our paths did not cross. No, uh, I'm, I'm so surprised. 
Yeah. Yeah. in our lifestyles and our outlook and you know and our uh, our uh, experiences. So uh, yeah, it's amazing that we. <laughs> so give, give it your pension for purple suit. I, I just assume. I beg your pardon. Uh, get, given your pension for purple suits, I, I, I oh, just assume yeah. you know that you know. Yeah, I've got more for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, just uh, a little bit out of my league. I did like his music, though. I, uh, I did. I was impressed with him the first time that I ever heard him. It was just the early, well, early eighties, I guess. Yeah, actually, late seventies was when he when he first. Yeah. Okay. You know, right. Yeah. So. But to, to tell me this, are any of you guys music collectors, albums or CDs or anything like that? I've got quite a few. And I, you know, I don't know, John, that's that's half his life, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And music's half your life and collecting and getting it. Yeah. I've got I've got some good albums and uh, ones that I cherish. Well, I, what, what would you consider to be the crown jewels of your collection, Tony? Well, uh, oh, let's see. Oh, there's one. I don't know why, but I've, it just, it's just very special to me. It's, um, uh, J.D. Souther, uh, Black Rose. Okay. Good album. Some reason I, I just, I just latched onto it and, uh, uh, so that one's, uh, really, uh, Really important. Um, wow. Who's next? Uh, Bill. Classic. Of, uh, and, uh, oh, wow. Well, the, 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 it, shook, it shook my world at the time. Uh, Disraeli Gears. Okay. Jeez. Uh, yeah. When I, my life changed some, when I heard that. It was, it was in college and uh, at, a, at somebody's house and they said, I think maybe you'll like this. And from the get-go, uh, what was it? Strange Brew, I think, was the first one. And it, I just zeroed in on it. And then Sunshine of Your Love came up. And I, I've never heard anything like that before. It was rock and roll was different for me from that time on. And I must have, I spent the rest of the night just sitting next to the phonograph playing the thing over and over and over again. Yeah. And I, I can't remember, uh, well, the only thing like similar to that would, uh, uh, as far as like a world-changing album that just opened things up was, uh, damn, I can't remember, uh, it's a Bob Marley album. The first time that I ever really heard, I had heard uh, I Shot the Sheriff, Eric Clapton's cover, but then when I heard real, honest to God, uh, reggae, I the world was open. I mean, I started listening to all kinds of things from all over the world, but that the, the world just wasn't the same somehow after listening to that. Yeah. So those those couple come to mind. It's all right. How about you, John? What's a couple of the of the crown jewels in your music collection? Crown jewels in my uh, I would say uh, the be early beginnings would be um, would be Peter Gabriel's first solo album. Okay. With uh, Eagle Flew Out of the Night and uh, and um, gosh, 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 gosh. And okay, while he's thinking, William, be thinking of what what yeah you know, albums are your go to. Bob Marley was, is. I'm, I'm joining Tony on Bob Marley because behind me I have my live Bob Marley poster. Very nice. <laughs> cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. Three little, three little birds. It's a great track. Yeah. I, I don't really. I had a few albums. I, I got a few 45 records when I was a kid and didn't even have a record player. So then Did I... You know what those were, William? Oh, Elvis and Sun Records. Uh, and uh, in the 70s, for some reason, I was living in New York. I... <clears throat> Bought some country albums, and I can't remember the name. Waylon Jennings, I liked a lot, um, and I don't remember. We're we're somewhere. I had a bunch of uh, 
records at, from Sun might have been worth money. And when they were, <laughs> Now, um, have you ever did you did you ever go to Sun to the Sun Studios there? No, and no, nor back to Graceland. It makes me sad. <laughs> they, they, I didn't go. I passed Sun Records a number of times. I had a friend who graduated from law school and passed the bar and decided he wanted to write records. And he took a job working there. Oh wow! So, but I I left Memphis in the seventies and haven't been back too uh, often but that doesn't answer your question I uh, I, I, I like I, I can't think of the name of the albums you know unless it's a hit song by Merle Haggard or something you know um, it'll come to me <laughs> yeah well you, you mentioned that John gave you a copy of Steve Earle's Guitar Town right. that yeah. album is one of the, the definitive, yeah. you know, 80s country albums because he came in in country music at a time when, you know, fresh blood, fresh perspective was yeah. really needed. And you had guys like Steve and Dwight Yoakam, you know, uh, Randy Travis came through and really revitalized, you know, uh-huh. Uh, and that trend you know, went on. It started '86, but it really you know, went on for almost a decade. Yeah, and Steve's uh, like a historian. He might have had a brief interruption where he went to prison or something, but I don't hold it against him. He probably yeah. had a lot of material, but he has a great show on uh, Sundays on Sirius. You know, I'll tell you how far gone I am. I. When I drive, I don't even listen to the radio because I get carried away, and I don't want—I don't want to have an accident. And I'm not—I'm not, I'm not drinking. Or <laughs> in the book, I had to try to con God. Someone said, "Help me get through this," and I won't. Mm-hmm. So but it's kind of hard to put it down uh, and drink. For me, some people—I never drank when I worked, but it, it's in the book and. Uh, the arrest and uh, things I'm not proud of, self sabotage, self doubt. How'd I get off on that? What album? <laughs> <laughs> well, a- actually, it's that you know, you could probably write a country album yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I wish that I had learned to write songs. I could never sing them, but I have some friends that have written actually. Number one songs from Mo Bandy, put uh, John Anderson and others. But <clears throat> uh, you know, I'll just stick to. Uh, I feel like I was lucky to get to act. You know, <laughs> I have good things. So maybe you could take you know some of your stories that you tell in the book and turn those into lyrics and let your friends write the music. There you go. Oh. Yeah. You know, I, oh, thank you for that thought. But I, 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 I used to say words, and a songwriter friend of mine, I'm gonna write a song about that, and he'd put it down. <laughs> but and now, you know, that's a skill I don't have. But um, thank you for the thought. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Well, tell you what, the you know. Uh, are are you still Tony? We'll start with you. Uh, are you still you know adding new music to your collection, or do you have what you've got and you're pretty much content with that? Um, yeah, the last uh, uh, seven years or so, I uh, I've been fortunate over over my lifetime. I've been a uh, um, I've been with some marvelous ladies, and it seems like. They they would do the buying because I'm a cheap bugger, and uh, so th- I was introduced to uh, wonderful music, and I uh, I got to mostly keep the the albums and CDs and tapes, and so uh, my uh, my wife passed away about seven years ago, and th- and they stopped the CD collections coming in. She was pretty much responsible for that, and. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, it's been uh, 
it's been a few years since I've heard anything that would interest me enough to go out and buy it. Well, I'll tell you, you know, there's actually a lot of good stuff out there. I'm However, sure. you have to, you know, really go look for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because it, it's very hard, you know, unless you're doing very formula stuff that fits the very tight playlists that radio has. You know, it's hard for a new artist to, to break through. So, you know, uh, you say there is a lot of good stuff out there. However, you you actually have to be proactive and, you know, go looking for it. You know, yeah. the, but uh, the is, is it's there. <laughs> so. yeah, I should I've gotten, every once in a while, somebody would, uh, I, I hear something uh and I mean, I'm coming from somewhere or at someone's house or or, or whatever uh, in passing, and I said, wow, that's, you know, that's good. Uh, who is it and where do they come from and how do you hear it and so forth? But that's about as far as it goes. I don't know. Maybe maybe that light is dim <laughs> as the years go by. I don't know. And maybe I'm just a little bit more complacent than I used to be about uh, oh, about art in general, I suppose. And uh, yeah, and, uh, also it's it's very easy just to lay back with the old blanket of your of the music you know and the music you've had. Uh, it's it's easy that way. Yeah, you know, it, it's 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 like comfort food. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's much easier than, as you say, going out on safari and saying, I, I want to hear some good new music. Uh, yeah, it's, right. it's just so easy to, well, I already got this. Yeah. <laughs> May I ask something? You are not uh, business is so incredible. Do you write songs yourself or play, Michael? Uh, I've written a few. So yeah. you know, but, you know, it's not like people are knocking on my door. <laughs> it's like, hey, you have anything for me? <laughs> oh, but I'm thinking of an interview you did with B.J. Thomas, which was great, and how things evolved. Wasn't he a generous man? And uh, you know uh, what? All those people, and I never knew that he even uh, was on my mind. He was early, maybe the first to do a Dolly Parton call. Do you mind if I record it? What am I saying? Uh, your knowledge of the, mu the music is so extensive. I figured you were holding out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 thank you very much. I don't want to talk about so much. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I had been told for all my you know years in radio and what have you. Yeah, I'd always been told that B.J. Thomas is just one of the you know the kindest, sweetest, nicest people there is. He was and, terrific, and it, it, uh, it's still on. People can go look, listen to him. He's, yeah, yeah. And, well, I'll tell you, many, many years ago, I had uh, I did it did uh, a phone interview with Eddie Arnold. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, it, you know, who had so so many hits, and he's another guy that I'd always been told just you know just a wonderful guy. Uh -huh. So when you know we're doing the, the the interview, I asked him. I said, "Okay, Eddie, you know you've been in show business for six decades at this point. How have you managed to never have a scandal?" <laughs> and he speaks for a moment, and he says, "Well, I'm just boring, I guess." <laughs> so, yeah, great question and you know Colonel Parker who uh, really nailed this, uh, in many ways uh, was his uh, manager exactly right yep so, so but he was you know uh, from from that interview Eddie and I got you know became friends huh? and when I would be in go to Nashville you know you know we'd go to lunch you know, and uh, when he would come to, to Chicago, you know, I, you know, he, we would always, you know, hang out for a little while. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it, 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 absolutely. You know, a, a funny, funny story with, with Eddie, you know, his, his office, he owned the building and yeah, he, he obviously done very well for himself, but you'd never know how successful he was because he was completely unfazed by it. And, you know, uh, 
when when the, the first time I you know went to lunch with him, yeah, you know, I was curious because I'd always been told these things. Well, he was driving an eight-year-old Buick, and he didn't. He's like, "Hey, it's it's only got ninety thousand miles or whatever on it. There's no need to get a new one yet." <laughs> you know, yeah. but uh, uh, anyway, let's say, but yeah, just just as uh, down to earth and is possible you could possibly be. Let's say, but yeah, you know, I'd you know, heard the same thing about BJ, and he lived up to every positive thing I'd ever heard. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, Tony, you ought to check it out because he's just smooth as silk and always uh, like book Dylan wrote Chronicles, where he talks about other people, other people all the time, and how he was inspired by them and modest and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, BJ Thomas, BJ. Yeah. yeah, you know, and there, there's a clip of him on. Uh, you can see it on YouTube. Yeah, he performed uh, on a, a show called uh, uh, Larry's Country Diner, and he does his version of the Beach Boys' Don't Worry Baby. And it was just him and the great guitar player Jimmy Caps, and, you know, no nothing else, just an acoustic guitar and BJ. And this was just like three years ago that he did this, and his voice sounds as good there as what it did 50 years ago. Right. Some did, did have a wonderful voice. One of the, uh, there was a clarity about it. Uh, uh, just this smooth penetration and clarity. I, mean, it was, uh, I, I, I admired his voice a lot. Yeah. It, it's good to hear that he's, he was a good man altogether. I like to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Other genius types like Bert Bacharach, you know, fascinating to hear that part of the interview. Wow. Yeah, and, and tell you, you know, Bert Bacharach and Hal David, that's a songwriting team that when you look at the body of work, it's just absolutely amazing how many wow. classic songs those two created. Yeah. They did the musical yeah. you know, Promises, Promises, based on the apartment. Yep. Exactly. Now, John, what, what's your what's some of your favorite Bacharach David yeah, all, uh, uh, songs? Um, anything that uh, uh, um, anything they did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I liked all the stuff that. Um, oh, why her name went out? Her name went out of Dion my, Warwick. Yes, all the stuff that she did was great, mm. and um, and like I said, it, promises, promises is. I'm, I'm a musical fan. That's like one of my favorite musicals. And that originally starred uh, Jerry Auerbach from, uh, you know, from. Who did they do raindrops with? He, uh, do we know who? Was it Matt? I don't know. I, no, I, yeah, rain, uh, yeah, raindrops. Yeah, yeah. Who recorded it? Okay. Who wrote it? I, I didn't know. I thought that might have been. Burt yeah, that, that's, that's a Burt Bacharach, Hal David song as well. Yeah. Is it? Uh, I got one story, with, uh, apropos of nothing, uh, with Alan might say, uh, if I could tell it, we were all three at the uh, Super Bowl Saturday night. Is that okay, Michael? Absolutely. Music. And uh, we have all gotten to meet stars, and it was exciting. But Gladys Knight was on the show, and correct me, guys, if I tell it wrong. She sang uh, The Heat Is On. And I, I, it just shot me full of adrenaline, <laughs> and I loved it. And then Tony, John, and I got to go to the famous Chasen's restaurant afterwards, and I just I walked over to me. <laughs> That's weird. That's weird. But she brought her little boy, who was about uh -huh. eight old, and, and he loves you on the show, you know. So that those things stick with you. Now, the earth was supposed to be live, and I'm used to it. If you cut, you make them sick, you do it over, and I'm saying, God, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. And Marcus Allen, the famous football player, said, oh, man, just do it. You know, and we had to go on stage. I probably had four words. It was a heck of a night for me. I don't know if it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. During the book, there, one of my favorite photos, I hope. Uh, and we were out of character and smiling. So, yeah. Well, tell you what, speaking of characters, yeah, well, I was going to say, speaking of characters, yeah, 
the character actors like you guys always get the the, the meaty roles yeah you know, to it where you could show off not so much for screen time but as but as far as you know opportunities to show diverse talents or abilities we'll say a lot of times they're very small parts that have unusual names so I was gonna get a you know quiz you guys to see if you can guess which one of you three played these roles okay now if you remember it was you don't chime in if you know who it is raise your hand all right so we're gonna start with this one who played weasel Well, it sounds like a number of characters that I played, but I don't. Well, know. actually, you know what? The one I was was referring to was John played a character named Weasel on Chico and the Man. <laughs> William, you also played a character named Weasel in a TV movie called Street Justice. <laughs> um, well, that's too bad. All right, no, now forgot. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you three played? Hitler's secretary. <laughs> That'd be Tony. <laughs> there you go. You got that one. All right. Well, who played, yeah. if you three played Hitler? Uh, yeah, Tom. Yeah. What was it? <laughs> Tony. No, Tony, you are correct. In Time Cop. Yep, that was yeah. that was in uh, How to Kill a Mockingbird. Wow. All right. Now. Oh, yeah. uh, that, was, that was the uh, that was the second time I played Hitler. Oh, okay. What was the first? I I got into a Hitler uh, gig uh, gig uh, phase there for a while. Yeah, and you did it well. Yeah, it's a dubious uh, gift, but uh, <laughs> all right. Who played? The character male attendant. I might. I, I better not guess. <laughs> I hope it. Would, I. I don't know. That would be John. <laughs> that would be John. And, and that was in the the episode of Chips. Oh right, that he did. Where if you if you go back and watch it, yeah, there was it was an early role. You know, for John, and he was, you know, the kid working the drive through, yeah. and Don Stroud was playing the bad guy who was holding up the drive through, and he about pulled John through the window into his car. <laughs> and then you can see John flailing as Don's playing, trying to pull and through the window. And something yeah. else, the girl who was uh, who was playing uh, the the maid in the in Newhart, uh, Jennifer Holmes, she was in that same episode of Chips as I was. Oh wow. Yeah, for Julia Duffy, right? A, yeah. yeah, she was a pre. Yeah, she was the first one. Yeah, season number one. Yep, she yeah. is a nice girl. You know. girl. Yeah, good actress. They said they make up things in Hollywood. To this, to that. And they said she's too perfect. Well, like the she's the yeah, very nice. Girl. Yeah. All right, tell you what, we'll do one more. Who of the three of you played Merwin Noon? What? I'm sorry, could you repeat? His character name was Merwin Noon. That would be William on an episode of Palmer's Town, USA with James Earl Jones. Oh, I love working on it. Wow, cool. But yeah. yeah. So, so, some of the other great character names that you guys have played through the years include Runt, yes. <laughs> USO Nerd, uh, Weirdo, Creep, Little Germ, Cousin Eb, and Clancy, the Illegal Gun, gun Dealer. <laughs> I love you know, those. I'm not supposed to be doing that. I'm terrible at games. And th that's what I love about character roles, because you get such unique you know, you know, characters to do 
that you never get to I mean, those are all character names that a, that a lead role would never have <laughs> you know right. so yeah, to me it gives you a lot of you know uh, opportunity to show your range and the little details that you can bring to something well i took a lot of jobs personally that i shouldn't have and i played a lot of the idiots but i was very lucky to get later i got some little better stuff and uh, uh I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> when you were in, uh, he shouldn't, and uh, we have a family and we make a living. Yeah, yeah. Now, when when you were in Firefox, the Clint Eastwood mm -hmm. movie, did you get any, uh, get to interact with Clint at all? Um, just in terms of uh, while he was directing the scene, the one scene that I was in, and but uh, that was a wonderful thing about him. Uh, that impressed me the most was that if you were in the movie, you interacted with it. He, no matter how small uh, the part was, he was very active conscious. He, he made sure that, uh, that I was pleased with what I did. Everybody, it didn't matter if there were just people typing behind the desks or whatever. He made sure he asked everyone did everybody good with that? Was that everybody feel good about what they did there? And uh, and he was he wasn't just kidding around. If somebody had if they wanted to do it one more time, he'd do it no matter what a small thing it was. I had like one line running through, and uh, if I would have said, "Geez, I'd like to have another run at that one," he would have wound up the whole thing and did, oh, wow. did it again. Just. <laughs> He actor had his satisfaction, and that was that's a marvelous thing. Very rare to come across something like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and his premise for not making actors come in and audition and come back to my get differently. He will look at the videos. He may rely on some people, but he's a, I got to work with him, and he's another hero of mine. Yeah. What what uh, would you yeah. work with him, William? What's a memory that sticks out for you? Uh, well, the the paycheck was okay because I was on it, but the movie didn't make it. <laughs> it was called Pretty Heel, Burt Reynolds. But I was all good to go. We'll get off. I was off the role in the movie that eventually, and they wrote it for me, eventually was the biggest grossing in the film, but my agent said, you need to get this for Reynolds and Eastwood, and I took it. And we still get a little residual, but City Heat, that uh, Eastwood took over the directing. Uh, I never saw him make Jason, and Burt Reynolds for that matter. So. I didn't hang out with them, and they didn't call me at home. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess they missed out then, didn't they? <laughs> They're lost. <laughs> they could think how good a big star they could have been if they would have. Yeah. I was in Kentucky to see my parents. I brought them the first air conditioning they ever had. And, and, uh, but uh, as I left, this country girls hello to Bert Rowe and uh, I didn't say hello to him earlier she had said that movie you were in you had two lines I was I was in a movie called uh, Death Hunt with Lee Marvin and Charles Johnson and took me out of a great hole when I was born I didn't even have a car but she said that movie you had three lines I was on it six weeks so we had <laughs> You, you can't control what what uh, winds up on the cutting room floor. No one wants to hear my stuff. Sorry. All right. Well, tell you what. Uh, we should probably uh, wrap things up here with uh, uh, any other new heart stories that you three would want to share. Hmm. Anything? That, anything that comes to mind? I just like you're in the Chicago area. Did you wear a Chicago Cub hat the other day? I don't. I know. did. Uh, I was a White Sox fan, so that's. A, a <laughs> I guess it's good. I'm not wearing it now. Uh, I can't see that. For Newhart, uh, was probably the brightest boss I had, and uh, we had an accounting background, and I like to 
So yeah, I was lucky to we were all to survive the show and sure, yeah. anyone now and I hope he's well. Wow. I think he is. It, it seems well, how about you, John? I did a lot of talking about myself. No, no, no. No, I I, I keep in touch with uh, Ginny uh, Newhart on Facebook. She's always you know, they seem to be doing okay. I know you looked kind of thin when uh at the last Emmys, when they did the virtual Emmys, Bob was looking kind of thin. We're having a weight losing contest. <laughs> yeah, that's what I need to do. <laughs> you guys look pretty good. Bob was barking at me. Excuse me. I'm losing pretty, that one. <laughs> you know, they, they once said uh, somebody once said that uh, Tony looked like an Inuit woman. <laughs> I thought that was you. You that said was that. me. Yeah. Yeah, somebody made that comment to me. Yeah, that he right. Esco. yeah. it was yeah. a picture. It was a picture of me and my grand uh, grandmother, and you said you look like a couple of Inuits there, and you you look like your grandmother. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's there, right. uh, there were two two uh, moments that come to mind right now on uh, New Heart for me. Uh, one was the second time uh, that we, well, it was our return after the first uh, ep uh, the first episode we did. And I was sitting around, uh, we meet at the table to do a reading on Monday or uh, uh, whatever day, Tuesday, I think. And uh, I'm just sitting there, just sort of shaking on my boots, man, not only I get one shot, I got, we're back again, we're back again. And I didn't know what uh, I was supposed to do. And I'm just um, all tensed up. And this big paw hits me on the shoulder and says, hi, Tom, good to have you back. I mean, after one episode, it was uh, Tom Poston, the sweetest, most wonderful peach of a guy that ever was. I mean, yeah. it, it, Tom, good to have you back. And we, you know, we didn't even do a scene with him or anything. And from then on, I said, maybe I'm home. Maybe I'm home. <laughs> and uh, the other, the other uh, moment was... Uh, uh, it was, I think it was like the third one we did where we were, uh, uh, anyway, uh, Will McKenzie, who was, he directed most of the, the first couple of years, I think, um, he was talking to Bill about the scene that was coming up and he was going, uh, you know, Bill, I want you to do this, you know, and then give it a little bit of that, but not too, you know, so you can keep it down, but you'll have it just right. And then he uh, he turned to John and I and he said, and uh, you two guys just don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that was the direction we got. Don't yeah. do anything. And uh, you know, as an actor, how do you uh, you know how do you follow that direction? Don't do anything. So I I said, what the heck? I'll take it as a direction. So from that moment on, I mean, that, that became the foundation of my character. Try to do as very, very little of anything that you can, whether it's an expression or a movement or whatever. Just try not to do anything. So it was a challenge for me to keep that character. I mean, it was the character was don't do anything, which is a lot harder than you think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. They're both different characters, you know. I one voted for me for mayor, and one would never vote for me. For mayor. <laughs> <laughs> different characters. Well, I'll tell you one episode that I recall specifically, and I believe it was the first season, the Christmas episode, where uh, people get stranded at the inn. That would be later on, I think. Okay, was that season two, maybe? Could be two or three. Was it yeah, Julia? I think we, were Peter and Julia in it. You know, I, th that I don't. Really, I, just, I just remember that uh, Mary was stranded at the inn on Christmas yeah. Eve. There was a guest, Mary, stranded at the inn on Christmas Eve, and you know, oh, wow. it's like you guys were like the three wise men. Basically, was got oh. the roles that you were playing. Yeah. <gasps> Wow. Or, or maybe I just dreamed it. The whole episode was a dream. <laughs> kind of like a joke. Well, no, I think your memory is better than mine. Was <laughs> there, was, there was one where we were, were in the, Stra the Stratford Horror, uh, the Stratford Horror Inn, where we were flashing lights. They thought we were UFOs or aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, three, the three wise 
guys. Uh, I do kind was, of remember that. Amelia was lost in the woods, and she did. She, yes. Yeah. Did we uh, did we take her back to the inn or something like that? No, she came and stayed at the. She was. Uh, we came back to our our cabin, and she was in the in our cabin. Yeah. It was Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. I remember. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. But the, the three wise men. Right. And she wondered what we were. I think maybe she thought we were the three wise men at first. I don't know. She was scared to death of us. <laughs> yes. <No. laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Well, tell you what, you know, we're uh, about time to to wrap it up here. So, any any you know closing thoughts, final thoughts that you want to uh, bring up here? Can I tell that story real quick about Newhart? We we were uh, doing a show, and he got a question from a live audience. Where oh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, a guy in the audience, I wasn't there. I, uh, he said to Bob, Is this a rerun you're shooting? I found out what Bob said, but uh, I realized it was a rerun. The woman in the audience, and he might scratch his rear end, is like the Queen of England, you know. <laughs> it's the post and says, <laughs> it was so, That's a great story. <laughs> I think I remember when we were doing the puppet one at one point, and I don't think we had an audience uh, uh, at that time, guys. Did we? I don't think we had an audience because um, Bob's uh, dresser, Ralph, had just died. Mm. Um, but anyway, but anyway, I remember um, uh, there was no audience, and I, I and, and Bob was laughing at, at our little puppet show. <laughs> That's what I remember. Well, at least Bob liked it, even if the director was, uh, you know, had a problem with it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if Bob likes it, who cares what the director? I was just gonna I, say. I, I heard Bob laughing, so yeah. Bob that, Trump's director. Yeah. Uh, there's lots of stories about you know, playing the casting. I mean, the uh, costumer, and he was a great gentleman. And passed yeah. away right before he retired. But if I ever see you again, let me tell you a story about him. <laughs> if you got time, go ahead now. Go ahead, Bill. Well, uh, uh, Ralph always loaned me clothes. If I had to go to New York, he's a great gentleman. Bob loved him. But he knew what I was trying to do. I wanted to play a tramp. So he tramp like, and he cut the, frayed the sleeves. Uh, and, and he just said to me, when we came back seventh year, eighth, I don't know, he said, I, seventh year, maybe I'm six, uh, I fixed your sleeves. And I thought, that's really sweet. You know, I'm B level. I'm not, I'm not just a guest. And, uh, but the next year we got a, uh, we got a costumer in after he passed away. And he said, I fixed your sleeves and he cut them clean around. So they're too short, which made me look. The R word, which we're not allowed to use. It's just Ralph was, uh, maybe it didn't mean anything to the world, but it meant no, it yeah. free. Uh, and, and for the costumer, Bob's a star. <laughs> Bob would tell you about Ralph. He'd come back on Monday, and some of Bob's costume would have a ticket from a movie studio, a movie house. Ralph had worn his sweater to. <laughs> 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 Did that make sense? My story. Yeah. Cut me off. Cut me off. It was, uh, now, it, it, and I thank God for it. Yeah. Now, have you three stated, besides obviously yourselves, have you stayed in touch with anybody else from the cast? Not I. No. No. Uh, uh, Tom was such a great gentleman. I'd love, I'd run into him before he passed away at a famous place in Beverly Hills called Nathan's with his charming wife at the time. She was so great. Suzanne Pochette, she said, I'm Suzanne, his current wife. <laughs> so, but uh, no, uh, no. Uh, oh, Judy Duffy sometimes on uh, Instagram, uh, maybe on Facebook, she had, which. Oh, that's cool. Uh, but. No, no. Just keep in contact with my brothers. You know, that's what I want to do. Well, as I as I said, you know, at the beginning, you know, when we when we did our our tech run, you know, it was like you know, for me, it was like watching a family reunion. 
I mean, you, you three were really happy to see each other. It was very nice. It felt like that. Yes, it did. Uh, to me, it did uh, as well. Yeah. My brother. Yeah. I saw Peter in a play where he was Turk, Peter Scolari. And oh, yeah. Aaron and I saw him. And uh, uh, if that counts as staying in touch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was great when we did a we did a reunion, uh, you know, for the first season of Newhart back in uh, 2008. Yeah. And we went out to eat, remember, guys, in Santa Monica. And uh, that was kind of cool seeing everybody then. Yeah, yeah it was. Yes, yeah. I remember something he said that was, uh, I think it was a compliment, but I'll keep it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you. And I got to right, introduce guys. Christian to everybody, so that was good. I'm too in Nick Red. That's, uh, well, that's good. My worst spice right now. Is Nicorette a good tasting gum? Do you like how's the how is Nicorette as a gum? I get a little buzz from it, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We'll tell you what, we're gonna wrap uh, this one up. If any of you guys think of other stories or music you want to talk about, just let us know and we'll do yeah. this again. I had, had a lot of fun. Just yeah, talk, too. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk with you, huh? Thank you, Michael. This was uh, was a pleasure. And thank yeah. you very much for the invitation. Thanks, Thanks Michael. Anytime. Thanks anytime. for bringing anytime. my brothers back to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the reunion. Hey, we love you guys. Love you. Oh, <laughs> there you yeah, go, there William. Go. I'm that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Good deal. We all got the book. There we go, yeah. All right. Well, tell you what, everybody, that's going to wrap up the... Yeah. If only I could read. But anyway, I mean, I learned a lot after I left. There weren't two actors. You know, you have character. One time we were um, going down to a charity at uh, early in the morning on a Sunday, and it was a coffee. It was, not, it was uh, where you just get coffee and... We grabbed a coffee or donuts or something, and as we were starting to leave, each one said, "Did we leave enough money for them?" <laughs> I, I know actors that wouldn't even uh, think about it, and I knew <laughs> Tony did something that day I loved. We pulled in, and there was a limo pulling in, and we were in our civilian cars, and this actor said, "Who's in the limo?" And Tony said, "Henry Winkler." <laughs> who's well known ran over oh I haven't seen him lately I've been wanting to talk to him <laughs> and, yeah you remember yeah only was got the a Vons, he said uh, I had no idea who was it it's just Henry Winkler oh my gosh the guy shot off <laughs> I didn't see Henry and blah 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 <laughs> man yeah, yeah that was the uh, I, I called me that more said, do you want to go to this charity thing? And I had been pulling an all-nighter with Leon Russell. I mean, I, I was just sitting, sitting with headphones on, going through every Leon Russell album. <laughs> and Bill comes out of nowhere with, hey, you want to go to a, a charity event? And I said, well, I may smell a little funny, but I'm sure I'll go. And uh, so I was, I was in a frisky mood, so I could... Uh, he was a guy from Hill Street Blues, I think, and uh, so I I, uh, I sent him off on a wild goose chase, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> I'm proud of another one you said one time. Next show, we'll, we'll tell them what you said when you said, guys, maybe when they ask us to talk, we'll say, can I quote you, Tony? You got that. He said, you've just been working so well, maybe we just won't talk. We do what was best for the show, and that's it. We got the animal from here. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. If it's working, don't mess with it. <laughs> it ain't broke. It's just worked so well. Oh. <laughs> if you pick up a little money, we will talk. <laughs> I think uh, one quick, one quick thing, guys. I remember Tony uh, cut Regis Philbin's tie on Regis and Kathy Lee. Remember that when we were in New York? Because he pinched, didn't he pinch you or something? He nearly tore my nose off, that yeah. clown. <laughs> You're not going to talk? You're really not going to talk? 
oh, I bet I can make you talk. And, you know, in, instead of, you know, faking the whole thing, he turned my whole nose upside down. I mean, well, wait a minute. I know you're a guy and all that. You're, 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 you're but, but I'm I got a bunch out of that thing. Uh, you know, a laugh to laugh, but come on, man. But you cut his tie. It was really cool. <laughs> I mean, I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> I, I can't. I don't remember that. Good for me. Good for you, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, just, a, just out of curiosity, did you guys get it be asked back on to Regis's show after that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I wonder why that is. I'm not sure after that year. No, he was on forever, wasn't he? He um, was. Yeah, he was on forever. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't get him canceled. If that's what you're worried about, Tony. No, I wasn't worried about it. He was a nice guy. He was a wonderful. He was a nice guy. Yeah, no. But the reason we got to be on all those morning shows, including you today, I really hope I can tell it some other time because I know I'm liking to talk too much. Yeah, just memories. I, can I quote this guy? I stole it. We need our memories that keep the wolf of insignificance from the door. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yes. And I got some good ones thanks to you guys. That's there you cool. go. All yeah. right. Well, tell you what. Let's uh, we'll, we'll wrap this one up. As I said, if you guys ever get to get the uh, hankering, you want to come back. You know, the door is always open. So I thoroughly enjoyed this. I know the viewers have too. So I want to th thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to join us here. Uh, thank you. And I've learned a lot of music uh, from Michael too. I've learned a lot about new music that I never knew. Yeah, yeah well, maybe you can stay posted to what, what's new and good out there. But thank you again. This has been a real pleasure. Yeah, uh, great. on TV. And we have this kid from my college. Uh, Antonio uh, Miller, uh, receiver. So they play uh, play Rams tonight. It's a Monday. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, the that they do. Okey doke. So, all right. I'll tell you what. We'll go ahead. And we'll wrap. Tina Miller. We'll wrap up. And then, uh, like I say, you guys are welcome back anytime. Until then, everybody, thank you for watching. William, Tony, John, thank you so much. Everybody, have a good night. Thank you, sir. Good night. See you guys. This has been Music Night at the Majestic with Michael Boswell. If you enjoyed this edition of Music Night at the Majestic, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and at musicnight.net. Music Night at the Majestic is a copyright production of Starliner Media. Any use of the accounts and descriptions of this program, its audio or visual content, without the express written consent of Starliner Media, is prohibited. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll see you next time. For Music Night at the Majestic, this is your announcer speaking. Starliner Media.